So I think there's a series of conditions. Some were broad and strategic. Um, I think those really are focused on that the ideology in the region is changing, the mindset in the region is changing. Remember, we've gone through Arab Spring, we've gone through wars, we've gone through conflict for much of the last 10, 12 years. But I think attitudes of people are, we're tired of conflict, we're tired of hostilities, we're tired of this sort of you know, hopelessness. And so people are looking to a brighter future. So I think the attitudes of people in the region has changed significantly where this is something that was welcomed. So that's on the big picture side. On the tactical side, what really drove this to happen the way it did and then in the time it did was annexation. I think it's fair to say that without annexation, it's possible that the UAE would have normalized with Israel maybe two years from now, maybe five years from now, maybe 10 years from now. We don't know. But what, what made it happen on August 13th is the debate of annexation. And the debate of annexation, I thought would have been catastrophic for the region. I think it would have been catastrophic for all of us who are friends and allies of the United States, because the United States was going to have to defend uh, an incredibly unpopular decision in the region. So what we tried to do is prevent annexation and we came up with this win-win formula where we, were, we did something to stop annexation, but also benefited at the same time. So I think it, that was the tactical reason we got there. But to your earlier question, how was it received? It was received incredibly well in the UAE because it made people feel hopeful. Now, I think we're still going to have difficult conversations about the Palestinian issue. We are still very committed to the two-state solution, but the Abraham Accords actually salvaged a two-state solution because it created more space for diplomacy. So pre-Abrahamic Accords, we were very, very focused on strengthening and developing our economy. Between our recent engagements in Yemen and Libya, and between the, co the corona pandemic, which has really, you know, really severely hampered our economy and our economic growth, I think what we've learned is we really need to double down on our economic uh, ambition. And we need to de-escalate in the region, we need to grow our economy, grow our GDP. And so you have two incredibly powerful and dynamic economies in the UAE and Israel. And even if we have political agreements or political disagreements, there's really very little reason why those two economies should not be working together. There's no reason why we should not be trading, investing, and researching together. Why aren't we talking about space? Why aren't we talking about climate? Why aren't we talking about academic research? So I think the, if you take politics and policy aside, it is a complete no-brainer to make sure that the UAE economy and the Israeli economy are linked. We're working together on making sure we open up the lanes for investment and trade as much as we can. And I think it's going to be very beneficial to both countries and both societies if you take the two most powerful economies in the region and merge them together. Yeah, so this is something we take a lot of pride in in the UAE. And this was, you know, something we focused on way before Abraham Accords. Uh, Pre-pandemic, -pre Tourism in the UAE is about 11% of our GDP. So it's something that is very important to our economy and us as a society and a country. But the part I'm most excited about is this idea that Israelis are welcome in the UAE and Emiratis are welcome in Israel. This is something that was kind of new to us. For, for a long time in the Middle East, Israel is seen as this taboo. And I think a lot of Israelis think that the Arabs don't like them. And what I saw, especially after, right after the Abraham Accords were signed, is that there's this excitement or this enthusiasm. Hey, oh my God, Israelis want to visit the UAE and young Emiratis are getting on planes and taking selfies and going to Tel Aviv. There's this kind of excitement about being able to, to learn about each other and visit each other and see each other that was, that was not allowed before. So to me, it's really important for us to get to know Israelis, and I think it's equally important for Israelis to get to know us as a people, as a history, as a culture, as a society, not just as what is our policy on this country or that country or which, are, which is our policy on security. I think getting to know each other as human beings is incredibly important. Um, I think you remember that in 2019, we welcomed the Pope 
And one of the consequences of the Pope's visit is that we decided to build the Abrahamic family house, which consists of a synagogue, a church, and a mosque, to show people that they can coexist together, to show people that the faiths actually have no issues with each other, and to show people that we, that we genuinely try to separate politics and policy from religion and ideology. So I think to, for me, this is probably the most exciting part of the Abraham Accords, where we actually get to learn, understand, and develop a respect for each other. So it, first, I don't think the Abraham Accords were required. I think you, you could do this with or without the Abraham Accords. But depending on where you sit, you, you can um, analyze or diagnose the Abraham Accords for whatever lens you want to see it from. There's a lot of people who see this as the UAE working with Israel against comet threats. There are a lot of investors who think that this is a great way to bring capital between both countries and, and, and develop more investments and spur more investments. Um, the, you're going to look at it however you want to look at it. But the truth is, this was a long time in the coming, and I think we just found the right exit ramp for us to do it. I don't think it was driven by any specific country or any specific issue. I think it just, the stars were aligned and it happened the way it did at the time it did. And if it didn't happen on August 13th, it was very likely to happen maybe four or five years from now. I, I think this was at the end of the day, developed as a win-win for the UAE, for Israel, and most importantly, for the United States. This is a huge advantage for the United States in the region and for us because it strengthens the, the, the alliance structure in the region, but it also creates all these benefits for our societies who, who largely don't understand each other as of yet. And I think what we've been able to do is break a taboo or break some kind of ice that has been seen as a very successful move. And the best validation of that was that within, I don't know, I think it was about five weeks of our signing, the first country after us, Bahrain joined, and then Sudan and then Morocco. And so those were that, that you know, they say imitation is the best form of flattery. So to me, I was very impressed when three other countries followed suit because it, to me, it proved that what we did was successful.